All right, all right, already, my peeps. Happy Friday, August 4th. This is the first Friday in August, and August is the middle of the third quarter. We are halfway through, or we're entering the halfway through the, the hump month of quarter three of 2000 and whatever year it is, 23. Mm -hmm. Uh, with me today, I have a very special guest. Dum, da, dum, dum, dum. I just had to do that. You probably get that a lot. Dom Walker is joining us today from the Windy City. Yes. Is it really windy? Today it is, yes. It's, it's very still... windy? Okay. Yes. For those of you that have no idea what I'm talking about, Windy City is Chicago, which is where Dom resides. But we actually didn't meet in Chicago, even though I've been there many times. We met in Dallas. Why, you ask? Because that is where Dom went to speak at SourceCon. And this was his first SourceCon just recently, if you can imagine. He's been in the business for a while. Yes. Um, and funny thing, I don't know if I can share this or not, but you, you, you're, the only, you're, the only, you're the second athlete on the show, but the only professional basketball player <laughs> Semi -professional. My, 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 my my former athlete friend was on the show was a professional not a professional but like a olympic skier sorry were you were you were an olympic basketball did you play professionally or or college or uh semi-professional so i played all throughout high school and college um after college i played semi-professional um, up in canada for a little bit i also played here for aba team in chicago and then um, I joined the workforce afterwards, so I became. Well, you mean that wasn't paid? Oh, that's what semi-professional is. You get to, you got to play, but you didn't get paid, right? You got paid. It was pretty much working like a minimum wage job. And part time. Making, yeah. So uh, part time hours, part time job. Yeah, gotcha. it wasn't. It wasn't okay. cutting the bill, so I had to pretty much make a different plan. And I went back to school, finished, got my degree, and then I joined the workforce. Gotcha. Yeah. And uh, so Dom's been in the recruiting industry for a while now, and yet you're still flying through the air, but you're doing it at United, where I understand that recently you started building a um, sourcing team that mimics a staffing agency. So you're essentially making a sourcing team into an internal staffing firm sure. to serve United's needs for corporate sourcing, as well as taking in the yeah. responsibility of diversity sourcing, both of these. So you got you get you deal you, you, you deal with double lives here. I do. You got two jobs. I do. It's a lot. Um, but first and foremost, thank you for having me again. It's a pleasure. Uh, hey, shout out to Brooke, Brooke, Joe, Brooke Allen. Thank you for the invite introduction to Shally. Um, excited to be here, and hopefully, you know, after today's conversations, you know, I could drop some gems, and people can take that away. At least it's one or two gems for me. That'd be good. Um, but yeah, so I lead diversity sourcing at United Airlines. Um, I spearhead initiatives, again, within diversity recruitment, also facilitate in-house sourcing. So I do replicate a staffing agency. I started my career in staffing, so I do have an unconventional career growth in recruiting. And when you work in staffing, I mean, it's a different beast, like the hustle and bustle you learn, you know, the, the truth. Yeah, definitely. You mean when you start in staffing versus when you start in corporate recruiting? Agreed, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I may be biased in saying this, but if anyone wants to get into recruiting, I'll say I recommend going to staffing first and then segue over to corporate. I mean, you learn a different nature of hustle, you know, tenacity, you know, being creative, because when you are in staffing, your creativity, not only, you know, you're not only competing with your peers, but you have other staffing agencies out there you're competing with. You have your corporate recruiters you're competing with. There's so many variables in the mm -hmm. process where just to drive that placement each month. It's a challenge. You know, you have to be savvy at your job. And if you can do that in staffing, you can dominate in the corporate workforce. Uh, that's how I feel. Again, I'm biased. You know, we talk a lot about on the show about the um, the unexpected benefits of being in the industry and, and things like that. In fact, it's one of the questions I frequently ask. But, you know, inside of a corporation, having the job of a recruiter inside of a corporation definitely teaches you a lot about business. Correct. and having started in staffing, which by the way, I, I did as well, teaches you a lot about uh, entrepreneurship. And like you said, the, I don't know, the, the stamina, the grit, the fortitude, the perseverance, the so many ways to define it, but literally go get up and go that you need in order to stay the course. Because at least when I started, I don't know about you, but when I started, it was like, there's your desk, there's your phone. Mm -hmm. And it's all, it was, it was commission based, right? Like, 
That was it. So yeah, you, you, you either made your paycheck or you didn't make your paycheck. Same with you. You started in commission only. Commission. Well, it was a um, what they call it. It's like a not a, a oh. draw, a draw salary, right? So basically, yes, you could say it was commission only, right? Um, and we was measured by placements on a monthly basis to pretty mm -hmm. much you have to either meet or exceed your draw to have that commission each month. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a challenge, you know. So, again, I have that same like that that fire mentality going to the corporate setting where, you know, and I have these imaginary metrics in my mind that I go with every day like I'm competitive, you know, like. I see the corporate sector you know, when I first joined corporate back in at United Ground Express, which is a subsidiary of United, mm -hmm. uh, entered in. I saw just the pace at what everyone was working. Right. Like the bare minimum was fine. You know, it was like it was OK. Right. As long as, you, you know, didn't get any complaints from the business, you were OK. And I just saw it differently. You know, I saw like, man, how many hours can I get within one month? And I'm just challenging myself like every week, like, you know, increasing my dials, increasing the metrics, mm -hmm. increasing the hires. And that's how it started. So and you can uh, accredit that to just being an athlete, you know, having that competitive nature, you know, always wanting to get better. figuring out what Yeah, but you don't get the height advantage in sourcing. <laughs> you don't, you know, but you get the higher <laughs> that's the advantage. You get the you higher know? advantage. Get it? The higher advantage? The higher yeah, advantage, the higher, right? Not taller, but higher. So. In, in your state of the industry, the state of sourcing, um, especially, I, I, I'm, I'm especially curious for our audience to get a perspective of someone that hasn't been hanging around the SourceCon audience and SourceCon community. You just recently found it and you, and you have some good things to, to share about that, but you kind of grew your team and all that before you even knew about SourceCon. So I'd love to get your opinion on what is the state of sourcing in the modern economy, you know, post post COVID pandemic? Yeah. What are we going through in sourcing and what's your view of the state of the industry? I feel that sourcing is essential to any recruitment practices out there. Um, initially, everyone had worry about, you know, AI, chat GPT, but it doesn't, you know, um, eliminate our, our jobs or, you know, diminish our worth. It pretty much adds value to it. It makes us stronger, more strategic in our roles, and which I pretty much explain to my team every day, pretty much how you can leverage like our new, like new technology, new tools to better your job, right? To be more credible and be more of a value partner in your role. Like th let's just take the source or title. Like we're consultants, we're talent advisors. And I explain that to my team, like, hey, when you walk into an end tech session with a hiring manager, right? You get value as to why, hey, the why I'm here, our sourcing strategy our target and give them credibility and give them comfort that, hey, this person know what they're doing and they'll find us the right candidates. Um, our job as sources is unique. We don't find, again, this is probably biased, I tell my team all the time is that we don't find a traditional talent you will find through the applicant pool, the person actually applying to the job. We find a person right. that the Iron Match will, you know, will be thirsting for, you know, that, that dreams about. Oftentimes not a unicorn, but they meet all the bullet points of that requirements and the must haves and nice have skills. And they wouldn't have applied. That wouldn't have applied, right? That's More than likely, yeah, or, or very applied. unlikely they would right. have applied. Passive, you know, not even looking for a new opportunity, but we come knocking on their door or just kick down the door and get their attention. And luckily as United, I mean, we are fortunately enough an international household name. So that's half the sale. All you have to sell just the job opportunity, the career opportunity, our benefits here. You know, everyone wants to fly for free, right? So that's a, that's a huge benefit. You guys still a benefit? Because that, damn, that's like, uh, are you hiring right now? <laughs> <laughs> fly for free, right? And most of our positions are hybrid. So imagine working anywhere in the world from your and laptop you and remote. just working remote, right? You could be yeah. on the beach. You could be on the island, you know, working remote on United's Dime, flying for free. So that's a huge benefit. And it's a it's a unique talent to identify quality candidates, you know, and sourcing. I tell my team it's not about just how many people you can find, just throwing them at the wall, hoping that they stick. It's the quality. Do they pretty much match again what the hiring that, is looking for? That yeah. Is so that is a very interesting um, question. I'm sorry. So, go ahead. Yeah. No, that is a very interesting question that uh, comes up a lot. Mm -hmm. it, what you just said is is a pretty big distinction, I think, between the sourcing function, whatever you call it, the different job titles, but it's the, the idea is that, you know, sort of front half of the, of the process, uh, finding engaging candidates, particularly candidates that may not be coming to you in traditional ways. Um, it's not a volume thing. So do you ever get in, in your, in your position now, as you're building your team, do you ever get 
pushback or questions about, well, we're not just we're just not seeing the volume. We're not seeing enough candidates from sourcing. Does that come up? Um, for the corporate side, no. Probably from like every now and then for like digital technology role, IT positions, yes. Depending on how saturated the Why market. in IT and not in corporate? So the IT people want more and the corporate people are happy with what they got? I think or... it's I think it's universal and it's consistent that IT is just simply competitive, you know. So one, you know, we're we're competitive to the market when it comes to salary, but you know, some of the true tech hubs out there pay like a significant dollar. And it's hard to compete with. Some are offering like fully remote. We do press the hybrid model at United. So again, we have to be more strategic in our sale, how we do lawyer and tech talent. So oftentimes but not, you may see a, you know, a decline in the talent pool for that. But for the most part, everything else across the board is consistent. In the Chicago land market, we have a wealth of talent within within corporate sectors like HR, um, finance, okay. our sales positions, marketing positions. It's a wealth of talent here. So Again, because we are United, a reputable name, and our headquarters are actually at Willis Tower. So we have the biggest building in the, almost in the world, and we sit right in the middle of downtown. So you see us, right? So it's an easy sell to attract talent, but it's, again, it's about, the, mm -hmm. it's about the candidate journey. It's about the experience and making sure they can really envision themselves making that transition from their current employer over to United. But for me, going back to the state of sourcing, it's alive. It's rich. It's not going anywhere. You need sourcing. To make sure you have a robust recruitment practices, you need sourcing. Again, yeah. recruiters do so much. More and more companies yeah. are realizing that. They're just having a hard time defining it, right? Some some people perceive it, you were mentioning this before, perceive sourcing as a, a lower skilled job that is almost entry level to recruiting. And in some companies, they don't see it as strategic at all, uh, which is why I asked you about the whole, like, do you get pushback on the volume? I think when they're asking for volume, that means, I think, that if they're asking for more, 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 they're not seeing the value in the strategic. What yes. do you think? That happens. Um, matter of fact, I just had a role recently helping out one of my team members is that it was for a senior manager level position. And I jumped in on the sourcing strategy because they needed more support. And we had a hiring manager who just wanted to keep seeing more and more candidates. It was like, well, let's stop the breaks really quick. Like you have a, you have a considerable amount of quality people in front of you now. How about you screen them, push them through the interview process and they don't measure up. We still have a pool that's waiting for you. Again, just giving that assurance to pretty much let's stop. Let's stop searching for a second. Pretty much review the people you have in your current pool right now. That's quality review them and then if they don't measure up we have a passive pool that's ready to go that's our job we're building a pipeline for you but again right now we have some of the top people in the workforce now that's in front of you review them screen them and then move forward in the process by changing that narrative again that's sourcing record i don't know if a recruiter will push that much but as a sourcer i'm pushing the requisition forward i'm pushing the position forward and because of that we got the role hired when i jumped in under 30 days it was open for nine months when i jumped into the sourcing strategy it was closed within 30 days Again, just knowing how to pretty much sway or influence the hiring manager and push the requisition forward to get it done. My what team, if they don't give you access? Because in some cases, they don't give the sourcers access to the hiring manager. We do. We change that here. Um, what if they don't, though? What do you do then? We work with a recruiter. So basically, we have to educate the recruiter on you know that partnership and, and actually flourish and nurture that partnership as well to give them buy-in that we are finding credible people that should be presented to the hiring manager for consideration. Any event, there's any stall within the process, then we have to loop, loop in the right parties, right? We have to loop in HR, loop in that person's TA manager, or for the hiring manager, you're getting pushback from them, loop in their manager. Like, hey, this is the process of what's going on. This is the roadblocks. How do we get around and set expectations? Are we missing the mark? Are you missing the mark? Like, it's a partnership, right? But if you're not communicating, I don't know what to look for, what to find, why are you not responding back to me? Um, my team, this is the funny thing. I, I bet people out there may feel this way as well. I measure my team on hires. So they have several metrics and one is, is also hires too. But it's not the, it's one of is what you're saying. Yes. It's, it's, okay. it's, well, the, the essential one for me is hires. At the what end about recruiters? The, recruiters, I don't, so I don't manage the recruiters here. So their metrics would be different. Um, how I pretty much hold my team accountable. So okay. our recruiters are measured on from, from just, you know, basic metrics is like time to feel um, they're measured on just like pretty much balancing the requisition, low quality of candidates. 
but uh, they don't get any measures for hires. They don't. Oh, interesting. But my team do, because again, people pretty much devalue sourcing. So how do we add value back? Well, at the end of the year or quarter over quarter, I want to show you the cost savings that you have with sourcing. Like, hey, we fill X amount of roles. We save a company X amount of dollars for not going to a staffing agency. Mm -hmm. Here's the value, right? And I know most companies out there, like they pretty much set their sourcing team as they measure about offer extends. Well, personally for me, how do you measure offer extend as the true value component to the, to the process, to the team? At the end of the year, if you go to your stakeholder and say, well, guess what this sourcing team did this year? We had 40 offer extends. Well, if only like five converted to offers, then like where's the true value? Your fill rate is horrible. That's just me personally from just- Yeah, like, well, so, you know, there, there's, there's a debate around um, offers versus accepts, right? Yeah. So you have a, a, a higher is not necessarily the ultimate responsibility of recruiting because you could st there are other things that 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 are um, let's just say pivotal in um, making that higher for example if there's a disparity in the compensation yes. that hiring manager is you know in the position to perhaps work a little bit more towards getting some budget or moving budget around and there that's recruiters and, and sourcers and nobody in, in HR really um, is able to make that. So that that's really where the distinction comes from. It's yeah. essentially the offer is the last step. This is the argument is the last step that is still it, within our sphere of influence. Accepting the job is now, you know, a, a little bit outside. Now, the other the opposite of that argument is if you are a good recruiting team, source mm -hmm. or recruiter doesn't matter, um, you have a higher accept rate, even if your compensation isn't the same as your competitors. For example, how would any company ever compete with the the likes of the well-funded, you know, trillion-dollar companies? Right. Well, you you know, United still hires software engineers. Not every software engineer is going to go to work for Google, Facebook, and Twitter. Right. So, and you probably, yeah, I'm, I'm totally speculating. But you probably don't pay as much as Google and Twitter, but you have other other benefits, stability, career opportunity, free, free flying, you know, things like that. Yes. So one argument is we can't affect the accept. And the other argument is, well, you could do a better job and have higher accept. So there are arguments both ways. Hey, However, there. no metric, no single metric, no, no single number can really explain the value that sourcing has, because even if we contributed zero hires, there's still a value to what sourcing does. It is a value, that, and that is correct, right? So I still, I, get, I gave my team, you know, the understanding that, hey, if you're not able to contribute a higher on a monthly basis, however, there's right. still ways to that's make That's your, it. like, that's your minimum, right? Now, it's yeah. not a quota. It's like, here's your, right. your performance floor. If you can't do this, then you're not performing. And then we measure exceptional, yeah. exceptional uh, talent based on these exactly. other metrics. Exactly. Um, yeah. We want to measure your conversion rate, productivity, you know, your efficiency in the process as well. Our goal as our team is still time to fill, right? We want to enhance that. We want to have speed to the market. So that's our goal, our goal too. So it's still ways to measure your performance to ensure, hey, you are still adding value to the process. However, because of X, Y, and Z variable, we wasn't able to close that requisition for whatever reason, right? There is variables. And when it comes to sourcing or recruiting, it's not just that straight of a line of a path. Like there's, it's a squiggly path, right? And it's our job to overcome those obstacles. So you mentioned compensation. Well, if compensation is an issue, how do you get around that variable? Well, where is your data to track compensation? So if you pretty much talk to 10 candidates who were exceptionally well for the position and you're all over salary expectations, then where's your data to tell the story? Data needs to be shown and tell that story to move that forward. Hey, HR, comp team, whoever it is, or HR or hiring manager, we spoke to these 10 people that you love, by the way. However, their comp range is out of the range, right? So how do we pretty much find a happy medium to, to attract the right talent you're looking for? Or how do we lower your expectations to get the people that's within your range and this seat filled by this by X, Y, and Z time? So that's like, again, crossing that bridge, having that conversation. Um, for pretty much like, again, you said, let's go back to staffing, right? So in staffing, you measured on placements not by offer extends. It's happening, yeah, you're, you're measured on literally the dollar. I mean- You measure on the dollar, yeah. right? Which is also, believe it or not, in my analysis, um, it's also detrimental in some ways, right? Because if you're incentivizing the sheer dollar value, then I saw this myself, 
some recruiters will work on the higher dollar value placements and not fill the the p- potentially easier to fill but much less you know if you're going to get a five thousand dollar commission for this job but you're going to get a fifty thousand dollar commission for that job you know it's kind of like well that's my incentive what they don't realize is if you t- if you do 10 of these it's the same amount of money but you know there's that disparity right yeah why not get the low-hanging fruit i get it right but back to my point so just imagine the obstacles a person would go through in staffing right so again you're a third party you have to work through whatever variable you have on the corporate on the client side it could be working mm-hmm. through the hr you're working through the recruiter or a hiring manager each person can be difficult throughout the process but your job is to fill that position so how do you overcome that right so then, uh, i think I, I disagree your job is to fill that position with the best possible candidate right correct Right. Not just to fill it, because that's where we run into problems in both sides and staffing in and, you know, let's just fill the job. And then the person leaves three months later. Eh, That's not a great idea. Well, let's just say for you and I on the same like on the same level is that we're going to say quality is always going to be topic of conversation. Right. We don't know the latest quality. Right. Good Uh, candidates. Right. Exactly. Right. So when I say feel automatically, I'm only imagining quality. Right. Quality over quantity. You don't want to just say you got to feel for the month, hey, but the person leaves in two months, right? That's and that's a retention problem. It's a problem with us. So we make sure the person that we're selecting is the right fit only for the role, but for the company culture to sustain and grow with that company for at least you know for a few years. That's automatically the um, the mission. Um, but again, it's it's quality over quantity, and that's what we focus on. So again, you will have those variables throughout the process where again, it can be compensation, it can be a difficult hiring manager, it can be the recruiter. It's about, mm-hmm. you know, having a strategy in place to overcome those obstacles to making sure you do deliver. And what we want to do is build credibility from our end where I even challenge my team to start, you know, pr- start creating one pages at the beginning of the intake session. The one page is market intelligence, basically what we pretty much have, um, we have access to it through like tools like Talent New Run and other like data we have at United. But to come through with a one page that pretty much give you a guideline on how you would build the sourcing strategy, mm-hmm. help inform the hiring manager, hey, for your particular role, this is how we approach the strategy as far as finding the best talent out there. What are your thoughts to have an open ended conversation to help, help me refine the strategy to ensure we find the right people for you? So that's what we do to ensure again my team understands how to put together a resource and strategy the hiring manager understands our process and our and our and our focus to get the most qualified candidates in front of that person so that's pretty much how we operate yeah that's good that's good um i w- i wanted to ask you we we didn't touch on this earlier but i do want to go back to it because it's one of the things i like to find out about folks what what captured what really captured your interest and attracted you to sourcing in the first place. Like, I, we, we, you know, you were in staffing, but something captured your interest and said, and, and was talking to you and said, hey, sourcing is the place for you. What was that? Do you remember? I want to say started really, it wasn't, okay, I started in staffing, right? So it wasn't then. It was just part of my job to source and find. Right, right, right. You could have then, gone right? in staffing, you could have gone into sales. There's a lot of options, right? But you, exactly. you so picked it, sourcing and something must have, I'll tell you what happened. It happened recently. I won't lie to you. So if, if my team, don't, is, don't team is watching, <laughs> look, if my team is watching, it happened recently. So basically at my previous company um, at Kramer Crafts, it was an advertising agency. And pretty much it's a it's a reputable company in the Chicagoland area, but it's a very small company in the, in the advertising world. So pretty much every role we posted, no matter what role we posted, we would have to source for it regardless, right? We didn't get the applicant flow, wasn't getting quality people. So you have to source regardless. And that took me down like a black hole. Like I was just sourcing nonstop for every requisition that I had. And I was getting success from it, you know, and just getting through like finding creative ways to find talent, you know, um, doing back end search and search strategies. Um, and then really having to engage with people and really sell the company, having them buy into you. Because first, you are the brand of that company. You represent that company. You have to buy into you first, then they'll buy into mm-hmm. the brand. Just going through that process and seeing their results from it, see how it's converting to successful hires. And people were actually coming to CK and like, you know what? I didn't hear about this company, but I love it now. Thank you for bringing, some, bringing this to me, Dom. Like, I really appreciate it. Doing that just really opened up my eyes to how valuable sourcing is to a role. Um, it's a skill to source and to pretty much identify quality talent. Like it's a skill to it. So now when you do, when you, let's say you become a recruiter, you start recruiting, 
it makes it easier for you to pretty much evaluate resumes, right? You know how to pick apart yeah. a resume, you know how to screen a person based on their skill set and how to present that person to sell their skill set to the hiring manager. You um, know how undervalued reading a resume is these days? Undervalued. I mean, we yeah, seriously, we just rely on the on the ATS and the matching me mechanism and all that. But, yeah. uh, you know, a lot of, I got to tell you, a lot of people think that they, they, uh, let's just say they're overconfident. They think that they can spot a candidate from a resume, you know, in, in five seconds flat. But the reality is that some of my best hires were way outside the resume. I mean, I can tell you some stories about yeah. candidates that didn't even have the same job title, uh, like, I mean, ever, like they, they're just, their job title wasn't even a match. Right. Yeah. And so the resume would never have spoken to me, but it came out of a conversation that I had with the candidate but for something else. So I, you know, an example would be, I talked to this candidate for another job right. and as I'm talking to them, I'm telling, and they're telling me about what they do and they're giving me context. The light bulb goes on and I'm like, Whoa, you, you know, let me tell you about this other job. I think you'd be really good for it, but it's not in your area it's, it's it's a lot of what you do but it's just in a different and i've made so many placements and so many hires that way that it's i think it's a really undervalued skill. or or let me or maybe maybe i'll ask you what do you think is it a skill or is it just people are trying too hard to match keywords i think that's the um it's not a lazy approach, but it's the beginning, right? So of course to narrow down your search, you'll use keywords, right? But mm -hmm. then once you narrow it right. down, how do you then identify the most credible, most qualified talent within that pool of pool of candidates? But right? your keywords didn't the, my keyword didn't find this person. I, I only found them because they were an applicant for another job. For, frankly, I sourced them for the other but job. That light bulb popped on when you talked to that person. When I was like, talking oh, to them. Yeah. Got another role for you, right? But that's doing like digging into that person's background, um, actually understanding their skill set and knew how to align to the other opportunity. What I've learned is that um, many people just pretty much do preliminary screenings where it's just basic where, hey, tell me your salary expectations. And are you interested in the role? Yeah. And, and, and are you open to kind of expected, right? Like, we sort of have to do that. Right. And then that's it, though. That's really that's it's all the preliminary questions they ask and push. You oh, you mean that's that. it? OK, so that's not a, like a part of you're saying that they're just right. like, they stop there. So they're not listening for that other. And I've been content. coming across that quite often. I was like, well, mm. how do you like so if the hiring man was to push back on this candidate, like what value, what what information do you have to like pretty much give them like give substance to their skill set? You didn't do a full screen, it, you know, um, hey, you got to really dig into what they do and what they, you know, know how to dig and ask the right question, yeah. the right open ended questions to really understand that person's background. Um, I've, I've seen phone screens happen via email. You know, I, I don't think that's, you know, the best experience to do, you know, because, again, like it's only a one sided conversation. It has to be open ended. Let's have to be a dialogue. Get that person on the phone. It has to be a relationship because, again, you want a person. I've heard. Well, there's been stories where, you know, a lot of a lot of candidates like take a position with a company based on the recruiter based on their experience with that recruiter or slash sourcer. Like it's all about the experience. So I want to make sure at any given time I give you a high class experience to ensure that you feel like, you know what, United is the right place for me or whatever company it is. This is the mm -hmm. right role for me based on the experience I have with Don. Right. So, yeah, you know, we yeah. represent that. Um, Tell me what in in your career, you can go back as far back as you want. What has been the single most difficult job role, opening rec, whatever, what's been the single most difficult one that you worked? And I, and I really want to dig into why it was difficult more so than like what the job, you know, like tell me what, what the, what the most difficult one was and what was so hard about it? Well, I want to say going back to the advertising agency at CK, it was a very, wasn't a difficult role to fill, but the expectations of the hiring manager was difficult. Oh. So it was a legacy employee that was about to retire, been there for probably, I want to say 20, 30 plus years. Right. So they learned time, everything. This the person was a, was a creative player, you know, like yeah. it was a, it was a creative player over time where you wasn't going to find to the market. So like, well, I want this person just like Sally. I'm just going to say Sally. Right. But it's like yeah, but, yeah. Sally Sal learned everything on the job and made it up. And she yeah. doesn't exist in the market. Right. right, 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 right so right. now you provide in yeah. one providing data, you provide in high qualified candidates from like reputable advertising agencies in the Chicagoland areas like. I'm giving you the best of the best and you don't like them like you're not going to find they're not right? yeah 
So then again, going back and forth with the hiring manager looping in HR, we just can't get over this hurdle. You know what? They shut me down. I want to go to a staff agency now. Like, I don't mm-hmm. think that I'll do it. We're not getting the resources we need. Let's go to a staff agency. Now, knowing my practice, I give you the same, the same approach, the same, the same service as a staff agency. Right, we are a staff agency. Go, go, go ahead. Like, go, go do it, right? So they go to a staff agency, give them like three weeks. They come back. You're like, you know what, Dom? Scratching his head. We'll just go with one of your candidates still. I'm like, I just told you. Like, again, so sometimes you have to just let them go, like, hit their mm-hmm. head on the wall one time. It's like, I, I gave you Okay. All, all right. All right. Yeah, you know what? We're, we're, we're okay with some competition. Let's do yeah. it. Yeah. Let's do it. Right? But it was difficult because it took longer than expected, you know. Because they were resistant. Yeah. You're, trying to, you're trying to give, you know, um, market analysis, you're trying to give, you know, data to tell a story, you're trying to give substance and rationale as to why, you know, this person you're looking for wouldn't be, you know, exactly in the market, but we could get you someone who can do the job successfully. Like what core skills you need now today and what can you develop in the future? Like that's that conversation, right? Mm-hmm. And still we was getting pushback resistance and it just took some time. So it took longer, probably want to say definitely over six months, but you know, after going to that staff yeah. agency, they came right back home. Um, even happened at United one time too for a staff accountant position, by the way, like a staff accountant position. Which you would think would, would probably have been fairly straightforward because it's a well defined role. Yes, you know. And it's not and an esoteric role that nobody's ever heard of. Exactly, right? So that's the frustrating part. That's that makes it frustrating and hard to feel for me because it's like this is this is like this, this it's one, a standard this is one, role. Yeah. Standard People role. know how to do this. It's not, it's not complex. You know? It's not that different. It's a it's a difficult job, but it's not that different from one company to another. Yeah. Accounting yeah. principles are very standardized. Yeah, I get you. I get you. Agreed. Ya. And this person, same thing, applied the same method. They want to go to a staff and agency, believe mm-hmm. they can find better resources than what I can provide. Go ahead. Like, go do that. They went to the staff and agency, <laughs> came back two weeks. <laughs> You know what, Don? We're gonna take that candidate from X, Y, Z. Come that you found that you sourced by the way. I'm like, I know. I said thank you. Like, thank you, and that helped me build credibility with the business. They like, yeah, that. absolutely. Every one we of those, trust, we trust them with his decisions and the strategy. So it just, it just helps me more, and it worked. Uh, so again, sourcing has been a beautiful thing for me because I find you people that you won't traditionally find the applicant pool. Yeah, and once you find that, it's like playing matchmaker, right? I'm just. I'm I'm the I'm the bridge between speed data. Like, I'm Matchmaker the... is definitely the best way to describe what we do. Yeah. Dom, I wanna I wanna go back to something that is um, that you're you you're in a unique position to to help me with, and that is we we have a lot of guests on the show that talk about diversity and inclusion. We've had some you know really um, high level experts, but recently I've been hearing a lot about especially since the government sort of kind of got involved in, 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 in dissolved affirmative action, if you will. I've been hearing a lot about organizations getting rid of diversity roles or diversity leadership, uh, p- people that actually are in, in a position to run diversity programs. Has any of this affected you? You run, you build and run a diversity team. Is this just hullabaloo at the zoo? Is it just, you know, the news cycle? Or is there really something happening at the roots level that is impacting diversity recruiting today, right now? Well, you know- Is there a backlash to this or a- Politically, I wanna say yes, but for the companies who stand strong, I definitely believe in DEI and diversity. And They're inclusion. staying the course, that's no, what I've heard. They, they stay in the course, like United, yeah. for example. So shameless plug. They're like, whatever, right. it's, you know, whatever you say, we're still doing the right thing. And Yes, yeah. we have a strong team here. We have a, um, a very robust, dynamic DNI and and department. And they pretty much focus and hone on inclusion here. So like, that's what we really big on. And it's not just something that we advertise and we promote as day to day when you come to United. And that's the culture that we that we convey, that we display. So even when we go to like diversity conferences, uh, real quick, funny story, a candidate walked up to the booth. He was like, y'all are having a good time. I'm like, man, I want to I want to come to a company like this. I'm like, I'm <laughs> Wait, like, you're having fun at work? That's I'm not like, allowed. I'm like, you wouldn't believe I just met them today. Like, I just got the volunteers to come in. We all flew in today. I just met them today. Like, I didn't, I don't even know them really like that. Oh my, like, that's the culture we have at United. And people were very like, they were flabbergasted. They were like, this is pretty cool. It's like, well, that's who we are, you know. Uh, that's what know. happens when you fly first class. I mean, come on, really, you know. That's that's what happens, right? You fly <laughs> in the sky. No. Um, we have a a very like a, a very like keen focus on our employee resource groups here. You know, we support every walk of life. 
uh, we make sure we push for diversity across our leadership too. We know it was a problem before, but we're now setting goals and, and placing metrics to where we can achieve like greater diversity throughout the organization. But the market and, isn't the market isn't complaining about this. They're not. They're no, not. So it's it's not, it's, it's not really affecting the day to day of recruiting. So, like so what my, are the biggest challenges then in running a, a recruiting practice? or sourcing practice, uh, specializing in, in diversity. It's one of, you know, you've got two jobs. So we talked a lot about the first one. What are some of the biggest challenges that a diversity sourcing practice uh, eliminate runs into? Eliminating eliminate unconscious bias within hiring. Oh, man, tell me about it. Wow. So Oof. that's the challenge. Um, but you change that by finding quality. Again, going back to quality, right? Quality that first talent. So again, we don't do want to say, we want to hire the best talent for the role. And I challenge my team to where they have a two to one ratio. So every two candidates you submit to a requisition, one has to be diverse, right? But quality, though, qualified. Oh, oh, okay. So it's a so well, can, 30, 33% or something like that. Right. Okay. So we can improve our one, our diverse interview slates, um, our diverse yep. applicant pool, and then hopefully they will equate to diverse hires throughout the organization. Mm -hmm. the, the organizations that are leading within their industry are the ones that are diverse. You know, think about diversity of thought, you know, uh, diversity of just innovation. Like it goes so far. Oh, yeah. No, uh, it's, uh, I don't think there's a doubt on whether or not. I don't think anybody doubts the value of it at but, all. It's just that's been politicized, you know, and, and, and now apparently it's been depoliticized. I don't know. It's, it's the so news is always changing after whatever the next story is. So honestly, um, Shali, so I was talking to my team about this this morning, which is funny, is that it starts from within, from our team. You know, can't just speak it. We have to live it and be intentional about diversity, right? You know, just being kind to people, be intentional, be recognized of different cultures and ethnicities, and actually embrace it and try to understand that. And then two, like once you really embody it and live it in the day to day, you can now vocalize it and you know be a resource to your hiring managers and also convey to them the story and why they should you know be open to diverse talent and how it could pretty much promote and benefit their department. So it's just building education. Now most will actually hop on board, but it takes time to keep like just repeating the process until they get it. Yeah. Um, just imagine. You know, back when, where before diversity became a thing, it just took people to, to repeatedly just be persistent. You can't just swing one time and say, know what I missed, I'm done. You got to keep swinging until you hit a home run. This is not a, it's not like a one swing, a home run hit. You have to keep going and be consistent, persistent, sharing the Yeah, message. it's not a, it's not a, a yeah. program. It's a, it's a, it's a fundamental change, right? It's not something yeah. that you're going to just do for a while. And then, yeah, we're done. We did, we finished our diversity program. It's done. It's complete. <laughs> like, yeah. When's that going to happen? Right. It, it but this whole bias thing, this whole unconscious bias. I mean, I, I was, I was reading this. There's, there's 14 different kinds of unconscious bias yeah. <laughs> that, that people are affected by. And yeah. obviously the, the term unconscious, I mean, you don't know. It's just, no, no. it's just there and you don't know. Right. I mean, like you probably, most people probably know about the halo um, or uh, tendencies, you know, yeah. some interviewers like to like specific things or, or recency freshness, right. The contrast effect. Yeah. Um, of course, everybody knows about prejudice. I don't know if that's, that, that can very often be unconscious, but sometimes it's not even unconscious. It's straight up like, you know, prejudice, but then there's also, um, the horns bias, you know, the opposite of the halo. There's the the affinity bias, confirmation so bias, yeah. social comparison bias, intuition bias, uh, conformity, beauty bias. People don't talk about that enough, right? The handsome looking, yeah. pretty looking people get the get the job sometimes, or uh, the the illusion of correlation, like this is related to that, but it really isn't bias. Um, I mean, you know, there's even one I learned about recently called affect heuristic bias. Oh, Affect okay. heuristic bias are mental shortcuts where people tend to um, get used to making a decision a particular way. And so they emotionally react to information with that information or that particular decision. So like, for example, oh. I'm just going to, you know, um, I was bullied by people who are six feet tall. So now every time I see someone six foot tall, I think that they, they must not be good people. Right. It's a mental shortcut that we developed almost as a, you know, maybe a preservation instinct or whatever. Um, but we talked about overconfidence bias, expectation anchor bias, right? Mm -hmm. When when we think that we know what it what it's going to take, but then and we don't see it, so we move on to the next person. But it really 
was there. I mean, there's so much to it. Are you guys involved at all with, with is, is your part of your structure to also maybe provide some education on this or is there a whole nother team? Yes. Um, we just ran through another famous plug, right? Management um, diversity training course for, diversity for hiring managers. For hiring managers. So for us, well, it's, it was for recruiters to educate hiring managers. Right. right. So gotcha. Help, I see what you're saying. Help sell the story and, and build yep. the rationale as to why, you know, diversity is key. And, and, and what are the biases? And yeah, this stuff. We're exactly. just talking about. It's, yeah. it's a, 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 like 40 has a bunch of them. Right. It's a lot of biases out there. So um, so here's the thing. Right. You just you just jog this thought right now is that. When I first connected with a hiring manager, when I first joined United, it was automatically biased there because his last experience was, I don't know what it was, but I know it wasn't good. <laughs> so that's that happened. He, yeah, right. It's almost he, like I've worked with corporate recruiters before and they let me down. Therefore, you're going to let me down. Basically, like when he looked at me, I mean, we were on the call, wasn't giving me no eye contact, just kind of like brushing me off, wasn't even taking me seriously. Like, just another recruiter, like, okay, another Because the other recruiter let him down. Right. Exactly. And I guess it was horrible. It was really bad. So uh, that happened. I can relate. But bias start there. Right. So back to the key thing about persistence, it doesn't stop. Right. Because you do have that perception of, of our of the corporate team. Let me help you change that. Right. It's a, it's a continuous fight. Whether I show you through my, my, my work, my performance, my productivity or and the quality of candidates I submit to you. Let me show you. Right. And change that bias. And I did. So. It actually helped me out a lot where I built credibility with our finance department. So on my profile, you will see I started United as the senior recruiter of finance. That was my first job coming into the role. It's and the place to be because that's where the money is, right? That's where the money was, right? It was the bread <laughs> and a lot of visibility with the organization as well. So with doing that, finance already had a strong perception about recruiting in general based on, again, the last recruiter. Uh -huh. um, I changed that bias, right? Again, being persistent, being consistent in my work ethic. Um being a value partner, actually just building that relationship and again, giving quality to the role where I'm coming to you with ed tech sessions. I'm not just passing four resumes. I'm, I'm not a resume pusher. I give you write ups, submittals, give you a, a detailed story of that person's background. I gave you an experience and a change. Uh, I mean, doing that led to a lot of success immediately that led to my role now today. So again, by start there, you know, just dealing with the recruiter, but we have to change that being persistent and keep just educating them, right? And if not, there's been exercises where we do blind copy resumes. Take the, take the school away, take the name away, you know, probably take the company name away. Like, just so you can see, like, look, you know, all these people are good. You missed out on X, an yeah. X amount of candidates based on your, your bias, based on like what school they attended, what company. Man, I see, I, yeah, that, that's kind of dirty. I, I see people looking at that kind of stuff. And, and honestly, it's kind of, it's challenging to blind a resume because they find ways to it, it doesn't even have to do with the pictures on, on linkedin that's like well like don't even get me started on that that's a huge problem but on an actual resume plain text resume where there's no images they'll look at the school or they'll look at mm -hmm. you know I, I i had this really bad situation you probably don't know atlanta that well have you been to atlanta before yes i have you have so um atlanta's got like 11 counties <laughs> a lot of counties in the city of atlanta mm -hmm. um Anyway, I had this one client when I was working at a staffing firm that while I was doing the intake meeting with them, over, this was over the phone. We, we didn't meet in person, but they because it was an established account. It was just a new rec. Mm -hmm. They're like, uh, yeah, don't, don't send me anybody. Don't send me anybody that um, it comes from this particular area of town. It was like, you know, a part of town that and I'm like, huh? It, I, did, I, did, I didn't register because I don't think that way, right? right. And it didn't register. I'm like, wait, so like, what is it because of the commute? Is there no tra public transportation? What are the limitations? Like, what are, and he repeated it like almost like slowly, like maybe I didn't, under like maybe I was dumb or something. Like, yeah. no, no, I don't want you to send me anybody from, right, blank, blank, yes. blank part of town. Right. And I'm like, okay. The account manager was on the other side of the table. The the sales guy was on the other side, of the table, and he's looking at me, going, "He's like, don't it's like, just, don't go there, like, don't go there." And I'm like, um, "Okay." So I get it. I get through the rest of the call, and we hang up the call. And like, my account manager's like, "Dude, people who live there are black." And I'm like, "What?" He's like, "Yeah, that's like, it, it's it's a you know highly densely populated." area of african americans yeah. that live in that part of town and i'm like we're in atlanta uh, hello i mean <laughs> it's atlanta it's, it's atlanta, I, right? i'm assuming chicago is a lot like that it's a very diverse city i mean 
So it just shook me. And, and I was like, are you telling me that this hiring manager said he didn't want us to send anybody there because of race? And the guy was like, Steve was like, yeah. I'm like, um, not working this one. And he's like, yeah, no, we're not. <laughs> We're not working this one. I was like, oh, my God. They said that on the phone. And it's just Yo, so that's bad. Crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, here's the, the address. I'm, I'm telling you, the address is enough to be discriminatory. It's, yeah. Um, I had a hiring manager who didn't want to review anyone with an open to work look icon on their LinkedIn profile. No one. I was like. I never heard this before. Like, I don't like people. Like, the people don't, they, they don't stay here. Like, we can't retain them. I don't want any more for open to work. I, yeah. I, I was at this company for 14 years and the company went out of business and now I'm open to work. So that makes me uh, a bad person. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. So I have okay. To, I have to hop on the phone with this person, you know, and with their actually, with their director as well. Like, hold on, let's get on the same page about this, right? Like, Repeat that again. Let's make like let's make sense of it, you know. And then they pretty much went back when they were. I'm like, oh, okay, now it makes sense. Oh, we got you. But no, we got around that, right? So sometimes you have to meet people where they at and actually address it, you know, have those crucial conversations too. Um, and I think um, a lot of people may stray away from it, you know. But I think crucial conversations are important, you know, just to build a relationship and give like, you know, give them reality, you know, how they are thinking. You know what I'm saying? Why is this pretty much just unethical, you know, and what we can do better than that. Yeah. They, it, it makes your job a thousand times harder if you don't push it back. It limits your talent. You pool. know, I kind of think they know that. Like the, the person, I'm, I'm sure this person knew that that was unethical and they just. Yeah, like, what, what are we talking about? I was like. I, I guess they thought that they were paying a fee. Therefore, they were able to, like, oh, I'm paying for this. So I might as well. I don't know. I can't, I can't get that. I'm from another, I, I grew up in another country. So when I came here, I was, uh, it was to go to college and I was 18. Okay. And I run into all these um divisions of you know I, where i grew up there was a very distinct division of class right it was yes. like you didn't have any money you had enough money to live in the city or you had a lot of money it was like mm -hmm. you know three things it, it, but that was it you know there was maybe a, a some a slight division on religion but the reality is that where i grew up was like 90 percent catholic so really the other 10 percent that were whatever muslim jewish or they, they were just um, odd or different, but it wasn't like they were discriminated mm -hmm. against. It just, they just stood out for that reason because they were definitely a minority. But man, it, it, when I got here and I started seeing all these distinctions that people made, I didn't know, it took me a while to understand what the distinctions actually were. Yeah. And then, you know, this was early in my career when I had this call is this was actually my first job in staffing that, really? I, that this happened. That's why I was like, well, I don't understand. And so that was just such a shocker to me. Yeah. that somebody would do that um but anyways so yeah that the, the just reinforcing your unconscious bias statement from before right yep it is so um it just again i'm, I'm gonna keep saying it's just pure education and being persistent you know and keep pushing that initiative that's all you can do Push. Yeah. um and that's all it is you know there's no secret sauce no secret formula to it it's about being persistent well, i think it's i think there's also a drive right the persistence has to come with some kind of you do. I don't know. You got to have that. You spark. have to have it. Um, I think as long as you're doing that, you know, right. not afraid elevate. to have those conversations, you can yeah. elevate, you can elevate the mission, you know, you can enhance it and change things around no matter where you at. So again, it starts pretty much in your, in your everyday life. You can't just, not a switch, right? Because I'm at work. I know, oh, we love being in. Now, let me, let me turn it on now. It's like, it has to be a true component of you. And then if you can do that, then and definitely can change not just again the workforce but just change the world so it's bigger than just you know just the workforce in general yeah nobody's gonna just hand it over right exactly so dom uh big question for you who should be our next guest mm -hmm. have you had aaron matthews i yeah actually i have but uh you know mm -hmm. what definitely that was a long time ago, and I think the format's changed yeah. a little bit. So it's time to invite her back. Yeah, definitely. I'll uh, I'll reach back out. Thanks really, for that. Yeah, I really admire her growth and what she's accomplished. Um, so she's a good resource in the in the TA world. So I definitely respect her. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, we we've connected. We chat. We chat often. Yeah. I don't yeah. want to say frequently, but often. So I'll definitely reach out to her. Thank you. No. Uh, I didn't. Yeah. Uh, thank you again. Um, like I said, SourceCon was a definitely an eye-opener for me. Um, so 
that's a very rich community out here, you know, a lot of knowledge to share. And also what I've learned is that there's more than one path to, you know, get to the end result. You know, there's like a thousand paths to get to that middle mark. So I learned that, you know, gave me different strategies, different ways to be creative and innovative. So definitely a good community. Man, you know, I was going to just say that the last question I always ask my, my guests is, for uh, a comment or something that is a, a thought provoker for people to chew on over the weekend and think about. It's almost like, you know, leave us something to, to think about, but you just did that. I mean, you that was it, right? <laughs> you just said there's different, there's there's lots of different paths to the same goal. And that's gotta, that's deep. That's a huge, that's a huge deal. Think about if you're not getting the results that you want, it, it's about finding another path to it. So yeah. thanks for that. I think those no, are great words. It's, no, thank you for that as well. Um, again, thank you for the opportunity. I definitely appreciate it. Uh, this is truly a pleasure. And I hope everyone today, you know, was able to get some insight or probably enjoyed the conversation. But thank you so much. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. My pleasure. I, one question that just came up here, if you want to give that a shot, just came up on the screen. What is a best practice to help improve the rec qualification process? If you can toss this person a your, your answer on that. What is the, what is a best, not the, but a best practice to help improve the rec qualification? And then we'll- like The screening process as far as screening candidates? I think he's talking about when you're taking the rec, like, you know, the the kickoff intake, that thing. What is the best practice to help improve the rec qualification process? So I would say just the intake session, um, a, a quick plug for just AI chat GPT. So my team, I have several folks who are junior to like sourcing in general. So for them just to help them out of like, you know what, if you take like a snippet from the in-text session or from the job description and plug it into chat GPT, say, hey, be able to interview questions for me. Oh, when taking a rec. So well then I wanna, I'm, I'm currently confused because like you, you can be talking about two things, either like, you know, qualifying the candidate for the requisition or I'm I'm kind of confused on this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He's uh, when taking the rec, when the taking the, you know, the order, the work order. So as, as, as far as like, you know, making sure is is uh, I guess it's approved or it's a realistic, you know, expectations for the oh. requisition kind of confused okay. that's, that's, that's what i'm thinking about you know because like when you qualification okay uh let's just say you're talking about just you know doing an intake session i'm going to say just go with the intake mm -hmm. you know yeah. um ask open-ended questions um really for me I'm, I'm pretty much got better at my job when it comes to like understanding the job description learning about the day-to-day -day, the benefits as far as the career growth um any other selling tools you can have to sell to a candidate must have skills nice to have skills um compensation um you can also drop your own intake session beforehand where you can be proactive like study the job description go to the market do your own market analysis um right so perfect right so do your own market analysis right so come to the intake session prepared with your own notes right so basically yep. if you have the yep. job description details already and if you're come company, preloaded right if your company even have the tools provided to you like again, do your due diligence. They help you but one, help you better understand the road. Two, so you go in and ask better questions. You can also help you start building a sourcing strategy. Like, you know what? Let me look at like target companies to go to, probably alum schools or diverse organizations, or you know, what um what are different, like similar job titles in the market that pretty much like replicate the same job, but I can target those companies as well. Like get creative in your search, and then you can go to the end tech session with information where you can help. Again, have the open ended dialogue. They can help you refine your sourcing strategy. But again, you have to give them the value as to why you're doing the intake session too. You can't just say, hey, this is part of the process, right? You got to do intake, but like, here's the why. So when I'm talking to top candidates, they want to know these questions up front before, we'll know the answers up front before they get to you, right? So if I can't sell them now, we won't keep them attractive or engaged when they get to you at the process, right? So mm -hmm. our job is to ensure we have all the information needed up front to sell the position and be credible sources for you as a source or slash recruiter. I'm going to wrap that up and say, do your research before the call and kind of show up with some of your own facts so that you can draw the other information out. That's really good. That was a condensed format. Thank you, Shally. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm, I got a habit of you know, synthesizing. Thank Good. you so much. It's been a pleasure having you. Hopefully we all see each other at the next SourceCon or maybe in Chicago Definitely. or Atlanta. 
You definitely will. You'll see All me right. soon. So thank you again. Cool. All right, my peeps. See you next Friday. Be kind to each other. Have a good Bye -bye. one. Bye-bye. Okay.